Who am I? It is a question that all men will ask themselves during the course of their lifetime. Some say we are a product of all those who have come before us, woven together into the person that stands before us today. For the Jew, there are some things that remain eternal. You're watching Aniel Amir. everyone, welcome to my channel. And if you're new here, I would humbly ask that you consider subscribing, liking and sharing this video. And today we're talking about identity. And for me, identity is something that has always come down to three words. And that is who am I? And I know that this is a question that everyone at some point will ask themselves. And, you know, for the Jew, there is something that always remains eternal. Um, so here today to speak with me from um, Olami is our special guest, Rabbi Jack Cohen. Rabbi, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming on. And please tell us about yourself and Olami. Okay, thank you so much for, for having me on. So uh, my name is Jack Cohen, as you said. I, um, I actually grew up not, not far from where you live in Connecticut, in Simsbury, Connecticut. Um, a funny place. I'll no, be honest, you miss it. I know you do, right? The Four Seasons or no? <laughs> I do, I do, actually. I, I, so I live in Miami right now. Um, <laughs> Where, you know, this is the coldest day of the year and it's like, you know, whatever, 50, 50 degrees, at least for I me. I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> but and I do miss the seasons. But, you know, we grew up, I grew up in a town where there were quite a few, quite a lot of Jews, actually, in, in, uh, in our town. Many of them really didn't identify. You know, if you ask them, who are you? Maybe at some point they would say that they had a grandparent who was, who was Jewish or that maybe they say my parents are Jewish, which is an interesting way. You know, to hear that my parents are Jewish and not that I'm Jewish, right? <laughs> and now I'm, and you're right, and not that I'm Jewish, right? Right, but that, that's how you know that's how people when you ask them who are you, and then that's what they would say. I, I'm I don't know, I'm American or whatever they are, <laughs> but they wouldn't necessarily say they're Jewish. So my, my parent, my parents, um, they grew up in Venezuela, and okay, uh, bueno. <laughs> Exactly. So we so we grew up speaking Spanish and uh and feel free to speak it here because we have a big Spanglish audience. So uh, there's gonna be a good percentage of people who understand everything. Okay, so Spanglish is the official language of here in On this channel, Spanglish is it. Um uh, Malta is the official drink of Arroz con the War, if you haven't seen that show. And you know, if you're not Spanish speaking, we throw a little sazon on it just to make you an honorary. I love that. <laughs> I love that. I love it. So yeah, so we 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 would speak Spanglish. That was our language, and that's the official yeah. language we hear in in uh, South Florida in Aventura for sure. Um, and my you dad was that, it's funny you say Aventura. Aventura is exactly where I want to to land. Um, if it's not Arizona, now Aventura is where I want to go. <laughs> We're waiting for you. We're waiting for you. Yeah. <laughs> you guys heard it first. I got the official invite. And Bezrat Hashem, I'll make it there, you know, with, with my husband in tow. <laughs> so my, my, my wife, I, I, uh, we're going on a tangent, but my wife, my wife worked on me for six years until I, I uh, capitulated and moved to, to Miami. But keep, keep, keep working on him, you know, at the end, <laughs> the wife decides these things. I'm, I'm still hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. So we, uh, anyway, so my, my dad was born in Morocco. He left when he was three. His father actually in, in, in the 1950s saw that the king was sick. Uh, king, um, king Muhammad V, I believe, he was sick and he was, a, he was a friend of the Jews, but his son he saw was not going to be as friendly uh, to the Jews. So my, my grandfather decided to leave Morocco in the late 50s and he moved to, he couldn't get a visa to the States. He moved to Venezuela. His best friend moved to the States, which will be important in a second. He met my mom, who's Ashkenazi. In Venezuela, it's very common for Sephardim and Ashkenazim to marry. Speaking of identity, it's not. It wasn't. It was never divisive, really. Right. As, in, in Venezuela, well, so Hashem, people, that's the way it should be. People intermarried, you know. <laughs> and um, and 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 thank God, I'm very grateful to have had you know the Sephardi oh, and Ashkenazi yes, influence. Absolutely. And my dad, um, my dad came to the states for for grad school. In the end, his father came to help him move. Um, moved back to Venezuela, but really came to convince him. My grandfather had a great vision. You know, he saw he saw how where Morocco was going, and and right. and decades later, he saw where Venezuela was going. Right. And he he convinced my dad to move to stay in the states, 
And uh, his, his best friend, who they split, who went to the States from Morocco, he had a son in Connecticut. That's how we ended up in Connecticut. But I, whole I, places, I, right? Because it's almost like a whole, Simsbury is like a hole in the wall. Like, really? Like, all the woods. <laughs> the woods. My Venezuelan family is always like, why do you guys live here? We loved it. It was just so, <laughs> it was so wholesome. And, yeah, because it's not like Fairfield. It's not like Westport. There's like way more Jews there, you know? <laughs> a, random, a random place with the, with the deer and the bears. Exactly. Uh, but uh, it was, we were very grateful. And the truth is just speaking about identity. It's so interesting because I think if you, when you walk around Jew, with Jewish identity, it's like, you know, something that's not necessarily seen visually by, by others, unless you, of course you, you have, you know, you, you are religious and you have kind of religious garb, but the, the Jew has this interesting thing of they can kind of melt into their society if they want to, right. and they don't have to wear on their sleeves. So for me, I think that was very positive for my own like self-esteem, my own sense, my ability to, to not necessarily absorb whatever was going on around me. The fact that we spoke Spanish at home. So like, even as a Jew, I was like a non-conventional. Uh, <laughs> You're Jew. preaching to the choir. I feel like I've met my brother for sure. <laughs> you feel these things. It's amazing. It's a, it's a very, they're very big gifts to, 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 to speak a different yeah. language at home, to have a Jewish identity, um, aside from all the other benefits, right? right? Right. It, the, the ability to, to say, like, I'm not like everybody else. I don't have to be like everybody else. It, it is so it, important. It, it, right. I think that's so important because, you know, in today's society, we see a lot of conditioning uh, of everything to be inclusive and inclusive start to be everything to be the same thing. Uh, right. Like we all accept X, Y and Z, X, Y and Z, X, Y and Z. And to be different. I think that a lot of people are starting to become very uncomfortable with being different. And yeah. unfortunately, this poses a problem for Klyosro because Klyosro, as you know, Hashem has called us to be different. We're called to be separate. And you see a lot of people struggling with that in this day and age. My wife just said this to me. It's an amazing thing. <laughs> Yesterday, she said, she said, isn't it an amazing thing to think about that if you're Jewish and you believe in 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 uh, plurality, you believe in, in, in pluralism, plurality, you, you believe in, in diversity, as the word she, you, you believe in diversity. So then you have to be careful to not assimilate because assimilation ultimately brings the opposite of diversity. Assimilation brings uniformity, hom homogeneity, everything becomes a challenge, everything tastes the same. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, you, it was, you came out of a partial like this where Yaakov went into the yeshiva twice. One, to learn what is the purpose of a Jew and one, to survive as a Jew. And I think yeah. that latter one is key, right? Like, I'm still, listen, I want that, whatever he learned, I want that to be taught like mainstream because I feel like I need to learn how to survive as a Jew. It's, it's becoming, like you said, more uniform, more uniform. And that is not what the Jew is. The Jew is called to be different. Um, that doesn't mean that we're called to be better. We're not saying that, Hasbis Shalom. But we have a job to do, and I feel that more and more we're getting away from that in this whole search of a common identity. Um, I'll tell you a story about that. So, so uh, just really quick, you asked me about Olami. Is Olami is an international um, foundation that, for many years now, for uh, I believe for about fifteen years, maybe, maybe more, has been um, supporting Jewish outreach efforts around the world, North America, South America, Europe, um, Israel. Um, Australia, South Africa, really all over the world. Um, and, um, and, and more recently has been providing more resources and guidance to, to people, you know, involved in, in outreach, um, to young people. The outreach is really focused on young people, uh, between 18 and let's say 30, 32, because that's really kind of a, an age where people are really finding, looking for themselves. You know, when they're younger, they're kind of in their parents' right. uh, domain. <laughs> exactly. They're kind of absorbed into it. And then they're kind of on their own for a period of time. People are really searching for which way they're going to go. Right. Anyways, I was working in New York for an Olami um, organization. And um, now I work for Olami's uh, North American office. But when I was in New York, we would, we would do these, um, um, they were called open source Shabbat. The idea is that Shabbat is open source. You, you know, it's not a, you just have, it's free. It's, it's free to use. Right. <laughs> so we would do these Shabbat meals inside tech companies. Wow. Tech New York obviously had a lot of Jews in them. So we did one Shabbat at a tech company called, um, uh, I believe it's called Greenhouse. They do, they do uh, recruitment, recruitment technology. 
So this is a crazy thing. It's New York City. People work like crazy. And we did a Shabbat in the winter. Shabbat, the Shabbat meal start, like, was called for like 5.30 p.m. Wow. So yeah, long, yeah, yeah. It's Friday and you have a Shabbat meal in your office. Like, you know, it's not so you kind of want to go home. <laughs> so we had, we, had, we, had, we had 60 people there. Um, maybe two thirds of them were Jewish. One third were, were not. But the amazing thing is that a third of the Jews are like, yeah, I want to do a Shabbat meal. Um, a third, the other third, right? <laughs> The other the group of the Jews, they only came, they said, because their non-Jewish co-workers said, hey, hey, you know, John. Is, like, yeah, they, like, they, you put, they put the Jewish guilt on them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why they came. And that's why they came. So you had this amazing thing. It was an unplugged Shabbat. People would take their phones and put it in a basket at the door. And it was an amazing. And you were time. successful in that? <laughs> it was amazing. It was everyone did these people work in tech they're they're like they, they wanted a break you just right. have to put the basket and like suggest right um and everyone did it at the end of the meal we sang songs we said the very torah it was amazing jews and non-jews at the end of the meal this 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 young man came to me he he grew up in like south south carolina from a you know evangelical family and he said to me i, I want to thank you i was like oh man he wants to convert what do I tell? <laughs> here it comes here it comes he's gonna tell <laughs> me what i'm missing out <laughs> He didn't say that. It made me so happy. You know, he said, he said, just being here and seeing you guys do your thing, do your Jewish thing. It made me want to go back to my own roots and I, and made me want, you know, I kind of became disengaged with my, with my, my own family traditions and my own sense of purpose and mission identity. And I want to have like a good conversation with my parents this weekend, really, and really kind of rethink things. Right. I was like, Yes, like that's so beautiful. Exactly. That I think you didn't just do it to class, or you brought it to the nations of the world, to the goyim who could see this light, which is exactly what Hashem has called us to do. Exactly. And that, that, this, that, that the light is not just the light of Judaism per se, but that, but not that he's becoming Jewish, but that Judaism helps people go back to their roots and, and, uh, and the deepest roots, right. you know, not some intermediary roots. Like, really, who are they? What do I believe? Who am I? Um, that he was inspired that's to be. Question. That's a key question. Who am I? Right. That he was inspired to be himself, I thought that was that to me was very inspiring. Right. Did you ever hear from him again after that, or we just? I I did I I, I did not, but uh, but um you know sometimes I think when you work in education, you have to. My rabbi always says that if you're going to be a teacher, you have to really believe that if you if you have a a, a real impact, you have to have a munah, you have to have faith yes. that the imp if it's real. It will be it's planting seeds. It's planting seeds. And we don't always see, you know, we don't always see it butt up right away. And sometimes it's a very dark place. And I, and I remember like for myself, when I was going through this, um, you know, I mean, again, you know, my story for those who follow this channel know, like in the beginning, it was like, I had no identity. So it's like when I became around that age, I was making an identity for myself in the workforce. I'm going to be something um, because it was a way to distract um, from the fact that I didn't have all like answers to these questions that were big questions for myself. And I think, you know, when you meet somebody and they say, hi, tell me about yourself and you have all these things to say. And here I was, it was like an orphan girl. I had nothing to say. I think in many years for my life, I felt like I was waking up from amnesia and, and it was only just, you know, for many years. And, and I put this in my book in many years, I, well, listen, when I was young, I firmly believed that the stork brought us, Right. And then when that didn't pan out, I was convinced that we were from a uh, witness protection program because I couldn't understand. We never spoke about anything. Um, and every time I asked about my grandmother's mother, it was like all like there was all these reactions. And at the time, you don't really understand why. And as you get older and you start to intermingle, like you say, with other people and you're leaving out of your your, your parents, you know, identity and you're asking questions you know, you start to see that you're not quite like everyone else. But it wasn't even so much as, you know, your family came from here and, and you eat borscht and I eat this, you know. It was more like I couldn't even say who my grandmother's mother was. Wow. And that I didn't even feel comfortable anymore to ask that question. And so for me, I realized, and back then, you know, the, the narrative that my grandmother and mother were really trying to push is that we are good evangelical Christians, um, which I think in a way provided a lot of cover for them because 
you know, in the M- evangelical church, there it's it's really like they have this come as you are, everything is forgiven, and there's really no questions asked. And if you don't want to speak about it, no one really pushes you to do it. Mm. So I think for them, it was like a safe space. But for me, I was starting to notice that there is something different. Like you said, you go home and you speak Spanish. And for us, it was like you go home and there was like these Jewish things going on. And I, and I went, you know, and for a long time, I couldn't even stay over like a friend's house. So when I finally got the okay to do that, and then you really start to see differences, um, it, it really made me question. But of course, you know, I think by that point, I was kind of being, you know, bred into compliance. And there is this really compliant, at least in my family, there was this, you can tell everyone was in lockstep. And you never, it's, it's like, uh, you ever see the Godfather, never speak against the family. This is what it was like, you never speak against the family. It was, it was a huge deal if you did. And so it was funny, because at first, I really felt like to even question these things, Um, was I putting myself in a position to be ostracized from the only family that I had, which really consisted of a handful of people. And I remember, you know, going through that process, you know, by the time I had gotten to a place where I was getting ready to start questioning my identity, I, you know, had made a narrative for myself. I had become successful in business. I had become well-liked in the church. um, And now to to really question that I would be giving up the only identity that I knew. And so this was really like, not only like you're, you're, it's like, you're going to start all over again. And sure enough, you know, when you go questioning in the Christian church about these Jewish things, you know, first of all, you know, it's like to say, Hey guys, I don't think Yoshika is it. That is like a no. The minute you say that, you are going to be branded late. Like no one's going to want to talk to you. You will not be invited anywhere anymore. And when I find, I remember just finally saying, I can't keep hiding. It's like, I just have to say it. And I literally said it. And once I said it out loud, that's it. My whole world turned around. Um, And I've learned a lot about myself and the journey along the way. But I, I find that, you know, there's a lot of people, ironically, who have not had such a dramatic, uh, you know, upbringing, and yet they're still questioning, who am I? They still don't know the answer to this. And why do you think that is? Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a thing, there's a modern phenomenon called being white, um, where being white is, is like um, a thing. Um, white white people will identify themselves as white, and and of course people of color, you know, um, will say, well, well, it is a thing because you're treated with white privilege, but like really, really, it's it's not a thing. I mean, it's it's only def- it's defined by by its opposite. It's defined because you're not a person of color, and therefore you don't you don't uh, you're not pressed like a person of color. You know, I, I I had a student of mine, very very close student, and he became. Um, he did teach for America in a in an inner city school in the, uh, a charter school in the Bronx, and uh, that he he wanted to apply to be dean of students, and so the superintendent, who was an African American uh, lady minister, she um, she called him in his office into her office, and she said, uh, you know, uh, Mister. Mr. Silverstein, you know, I see here that you, your job description that you wrote out for yourself, it, it's, it's all great things that, that the school needs, but there's nothing here that's, that's about discipline in the school. And like every dean has to do, has to do some discipline as part of, as part of what the deans do. He said, well, you know, I, I don't want to be the only white administrator, um, you know, who is, who is disciplining, you know, black and brown kids. He said, Mr. Silverstein, can you, cl- can you close the door? <laughs> she says to him she says first of all stop worrying so much about that you're the most like sensitive you know um ethnically and racially sensitive person we have on on staff second of all stop saying you're white you're a jew (laughs) (laughs) you know it took this black lady minister that you know to tell him he was i'm telling you out of the mouths of babes i've heard some very wise things from goyam (laughs) They just see it. They just, 
they they see it and i think i think there's this whole like american notion of being white yes that smudges together irish italian jewish german polish it's all the it's like it, it it's so i think that the people everything's so blah so people that you know they eat, they eat their mac, you know, mac and cheese or tv dinners in my day and and uh they just do what Americans do. So right. there's no cues. Like you spoke how there's no, there was no cues about your background, whiteness and white, um, this kind of false uh, contrived identity of whiteness is something that, that literally whitewashes right. any, any cue in your life that may make you think about where you come from and where you're going. Right. And I, I think that's just, it's a, it's a very American phenomenon. Um, for a bunch of, I mean, a bunch of important historical reasons that maybe in other places that people don't have because there's more history, there's history you're, everywhere. You're absolutely right about that because I feel like we are, like you said in the beginning, we are coming to this un uniformity where it's almost like we are a carbon copy of the last person that came before and after us. And there is no more, like, we're not questioning anymore, who am I? Where did I come from? How did we get here? Um, and, and you know, and at the same time, especially for the Jew, you have the neshama who does know exactly who you are, where you're supposed to be going. That's always pushing you there. And I do find it ironic that some of the smartest things about Jewish identity have come from your fellow Christian in the workplace or, in, you know, and they, the ironic thing is that I see so many Jews trying to assimilate and not stand out. And yet those same Christians are saying, be a Jew, be a Jew. And I feel like there's always this subconscious uh, conversation that's going on between the two, you know, where we're saying, I, I want to blend in, I want to blend in. And they're saying, no, you're called to be different. You're called to be different. Why do you think that the, especially the youth in this day and age are having such a hard time just saying this is who I am. I'm going to be true to who I am. And, you know, and just, and that's it. I'm not going to compromise, you know, my beliefs or my identity just to conform to what you are comfortable with. So I, the, the way, the way I look at it is that there's, there's a kind of um, circular relationship between um, self-esteem in the, in the kind of classical sense of, of, esteeming myself as an individual and my ability to walk around in the world and, and, and be okay that I am myself and engage with people and listen to them and not be threatened by them and, and really hear them out and understand that they're individuals and I don't have to be like them just because they're even trying to persuade me. And I think there's another relationship with kind of a ethnic, ethnic uh, self-esteem, you know, or, or religious self-esteem or, or, or whatever your whatever kind of the broader category is, you know, um, and that's why I think that you know if someone grows up being a, uh, a Jew, like I was, um, for some reason, I, really not so clear to me. My senior year of college, uh, of of high school, I'm sorry, um, my my close my closest friend since I was a kid, uh, Jesse Krinsky, um, he he and I decided we were going to start wearing kippas. Now neither of us was really or orthodox. Um, right. We didn't really keep Shabbos full, uh, not, certainly not fully. We didn't really keep kosher, certainly not fully. And yet we, we both knew, like we'd been through enough college, uh, enough of high school, I'm sorry, that we knew that everyone knew we were Jews. Like right. there were certain things that like we were Jews. And so we're like, you know what? We might as well, we might as well put on, put on a kippah. And for a whole year, you know, I, I ended ironically, but those who understand, understand that the year after when I took a gap year in Israel, that's when I took it off. Which, which is, <laughs> but but for that year in Simsbury High School in public high school, right. I had no problem wearing a kippa, no problem because I knew that I was different, and I think that was so important for me, my own development of self esteem at right. 17, 18 years old, of just being okay with 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 people, you know, looking up in my head and saying like I'm I'm different, I'm a Jew. So I think I think there's there's clearly a problem in self esteem in this generation. Forget people be, being saying they're Jewish or this out of there. Then people have troubles just being themselves, just even right. voice their opinion if they know Ooh, people are going to. Yes. So I think that's that's where it starts. Really helping develop people um, be comfortable being themselves, having a different opinion, listening to other people without being threatened or melting. Uh, you know, I think that's where we're at today. And and what do you say? I mean, if somebody who's listening or watching this now again, 
you know, we have a lot of people who come from like a converso background. This is a huge issue for them, this whole identity and breaking out because it's not just breaking out. Um, you know, it's like you said, it, it, it's almost like in one way, a lot of the converso people would would be happy in front of their coworkers, like that's their first step. But ironically enough for them, the harder step is saying who I am in front of their family, even though it's their identity too. What do you say to people who are struggling you know, I always say like there comes a point where you have to be true to yourself because you you end up going in a cycle, right? right. Like you have this internal uh, conflict and this internal dialogue between the neshama and the goof that's going on and saying, you know, this is who I am. I just want to live my truth. And then you go out there and it feels like, you know, next time I'll do it. Next time I'll do it. Next time I'll do it. What do you say to people to start getting that koyak to really say, no, this is my truth. I'm going to live it and I'm going to be okay with the fact that there's some people are just not going to like it. Right. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an important question. It comes up in our work all the time. Um, mostly when people, uh, when young people, you know, they, they decide that over the course of time, you know, we really believe in people growing and learning in a healthy pace and everyone making their own decisions. But it, but it happens that there's a, there's a lot of our, our people, you know, they, they decide that they want to become, more observant, maybe they want to keep Shabbat, you know, different things, right? And uh, it, they, it's very much like coming out of the closet to their, yes. to their family. That's right? exactly very, what I like in it too, yes. And they live like, uh, they live like, um, like Maranos in their own house, you know, they do things secretly. There's a, you know, one, one classic story my rabbi tells of, of a guy who he would, you know, you're not supposed to wear tefillin in the bathroom, but the guy came out of the closet <laughs> Dude, that he said that he was every day. He was every day. He was going to the bathroom to want to fill it because he didn't want to be seen. Um, you know, people have these stories. Um, you know, we can talk about what a person does to become to, to develop that confidence, but just kind of just speaking about the relational aspect of, of with family, I, I think that every person appreciates being with people who are comfortable in their own skin. Yes. It, the much more pleasant experience. Yeah. You know, they're totally different from you. Really, if they're totally, they might, they might have that, but they're just, they're just happy with who they are. Um, and it's pleasant. refreshing because they, they're living their own truth, which I think in the end of the day is something that everyone shares. Totally. They want to yeah. live their own truth. Exactly. It's inspiring. You know, if someone living their truth inspires you to live your own, like that story I said of, of this, of this young evangelical guy. Um, and I think with parents specifically, Let's talk about healthy, you know, high-functioning parents. Healthy, high-functioning parents are concerned when, when their child, who's in, in a vulnerable period in their life, is, is kind of teetering. Maybe they're involved in a cult. Like, they don't know, you know. That maybe yeah, they're being exactly. influenced by people. <laughs> so I think a caring, a caring, healthy, good parent, they're worried when, when, the, when their kid is unsure of themselves. And that's where I think parents really, really push very hard. Right. Right? So I think when, when, but when a person is comfortable with themselves, when they really are comfortable with themselves, I think, and, and they're happy, good, high functioning parents, they stop pushing right. because you look good. You look happy. I've never seen you this energized, this confident. You look, this is like, this is very clearly like the right fit for you. And that's when, when I find that parents relax and when they're nervous is when they're in that intermediate stage. I think what I always tell my students is, is, you know, it seems like you yourself haven't found a, a certain stable sense of peace. And that's why you're, you're externalizing it. It's like, oh, my parents don't think I should. Since you're 20 something years old, you know, you can make your own decisions, right? But, but why are you not sure of yourself? What's going on with you? What are your questions? What are your doubts? Let's work through that. Because if you work through that, then your parents are going to be cool with whatever you decide right. to do. And, you know, there's a pasuk about this. I quote this a lot on this channel and it, it really comes from the Maraglim. And they said, you know, we were grasshoppers in their eyes. And I say this all the time that there's something about you that projects out. Like we have all this communication that is nonverbal. And when you're projecting out this, you know, I'm unsure, do I really know? Um, people pick up on that, whether it's subconscious, whether they say it or they don't, and they will treat you according to what you're putting out. And, and I say, I say to like, you have to know, like Hashem has always said for us to know, not to yeah. feel, because if we go on what we feel, we'll never take the leap out there and, and grow into our authentic self. And it's almost so, like the inside will never match the outside. It's when you believe it, 
And let me tell you, the first time, you know, you go out, it's like the Yetzirah is really, he's going to hammer you. And it's going to seem like everything is going to fail and everything. You know, I always, I, I said this story recently when I, first time I went and I, after I got married, I was working for Bloomberg LP of all like people. And I got married and I said, I'm going to put on a mitbachat, right? And I remember going out there and I felt like everyone, including like the birds, the ants, everyone was looking at me and they were all, but this was something that I was, you know, no one was really looking at you. And in fact, here we go again with the Christian going and saying, oh my God, you look so stylish. But yeah. it was me that had all these, you know, I was having all these conversations in my head that weren't really happening. It was just me and the right. Ra saying right. how you can't do this. And so um, I do find that, that you're absolutely right. It is a self-esteem issue. And people just have to know like what you project out, people will pick up on and they'll treat you accordingly. Absolutely. So, what, what, you know, back to your question of how you developed the confidence. How, how did you, when you had your coming out of the closet, as this this is who you were, or you were deciding to the identity you were deciding to embrace? How did you work up the courage to, to do that with your family? Well, I said telling like I said telling twenty like ten times. <laughs> <laughs> I literally said to myself, you know what I what ha- what ended up happening is. Well, first of all, there were like my mom and everyone, they actually, what I had not realized, again, because I was having my own conversation with myself and the Yetzirah, and for a long time, it was only us two having this conversation, that it never dawned on me that they also were struggling um, with this, if, you know, for people who are new to this channel, don't know what a, what a converso is, it's those who were forced into the Christian religion while, you know, still maintaining Jewish practices. And it never dawned on me that they were having this conversation within themselves. Mm. And so it wasn't until I came out of the closet and they were like, my mom literally said, when I went through the mikveh and she said, you validated us. It hit me that I had not realized that this really was a conversation that it was just me and the Yetzirah. There was no truth behind it. It was mm. like the Wizard of Oz and you pull back the, the, the cloak and you see it's this little man. And it was for the first time that I realized that I'm having all these conversations and we do this in life, not just about this, about everything. Like I tell my husband, like my husband will come out, we'll be driving and suddenly he comes out with, and I'm not doing X, Y, and Z. And then I say, okay, back up. Let me know what the conversation was in your head. And we do this all the time. We have conversations in our head and we put so much weight on it that by the time the actual situation comes up, we've already predetermined what the outcome is. And we never give room uh, for the truth to play out or to let someone else be a part of that conversation because we've already determined what the outcome is. And so when she reacted that way, and I remember asking my grandmother, now again, my grandmother and mother, even though they know all of this, they have truly embraced the Christian religion. And so for me, this was very difficult to come out and say to them that I am not a believer in Yoshka. I am not, you know, going to be, uh, you know, with the people in the rapture. Like it, when I started coming out all these things, I mean, to, to what we've been indoctrinated with, this is heresy in their eyes. Sure. And I thought for sure that this was going to be like, how could you do this? And in fact, it was not. And I remember asking my grandmother, grandma, do you still love me? She said, I love you more now. And so it was very shocking. What was, what was her explanation? What, how would she have put, like, what did she say? Why does she love you more now? And it's funny because I said, grandma, I, I've, I've, be, I've come back to Jewish people and, you know, and she goes, I love you more now. And I think, you know, after researching them, and really realizing that for someone like myself to be able to return back to Klai Israel is something, it is a dream that many of their uh, grandparents, parents, grandparents, and great grandparents, that it, it, it was a dream. Mm. And what I've learned the most about them is this concept of Avinu Malkenu, right? Yeah. In a different way that I've never seen because they were always crying out to Avinu, their father please, I want to be saved. I want to be a Jew outwardly. And for them, they did not see the Geulah, their own personal Geulah on this. And yet they kept serving Malkenu. They kept doing it, knowing that they will not be redeemed. And that has taught me a lot about myself and endurance when I think things are getting hard, when sometimes Hashem's answer is no, 
Um, they have they have taught me a lot about keep going. And it is a tremendous hizuk to see and to hear and to and research their stories about the struggles that they went through. And they never gave up on Hashem. They kept doing it and kept, you know, like we had this concept of the, you know, the children being the guarantors and they kept this concept going. Maybe it's not going to happen in our day, but we're going to keep going. And it was that, you know, strength that they had um, to want to live openly and could not that gives me the koyak to say that my parents and my grandparents, you know, in my head at the time, I thought this was going to be so insurmountable. This is going to be a deal breaker. And it really wasn't. And again, I think that sometimes you have to let someone, you have to let the other person in on the conversation. Um, And I think sometimes you'll be pleasantly surprised, but it's not until you actually go and have that conversation that you know what you're dealing with. But I think sometimes the Yetzirah will automatically, like if you leave it to him, he will automatically tell you it's a done deal. There's no point in it. Um, but what I will tell you that I've learned from the Yetzirah is never give up. So today you couldn't do it. Today you said the Tehillim 20 times and you said to your parents, I'm going to start keeping Shabbos, mommy and daddy, right? And you're getting ready right to say it and, 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 and you back down. I still say keep going. The next time could be that time. But I think that there comes a time where you say, because I, like I said, you start to go in a, in a circle and you say, I'm going to do this. And then you compromise. And then you, you start beating yourself up on the inside. And you say, and I got to a point where it says, I can't do that anymore. Everyone else is living their life. And they could care less about what I think about their life, even whether if they're doing has shalom averot, or whatever way they want to live, no one's asking my opinion. So I got to a point where I said, I'm not, I don't care about anyone else's opinion either. I'm the only one that has to live with me and Hashem. And so I realized, you know, as, as great as, as there's so many great people in Klai that, you know, we have so many, Abraham Avinu, you know, we have, but Hashem didn't call me to be Abraham Avinu. He called me to be Devorah Esther. And Devorah Esther has her own tafkid in life. And what he's asked me to do is you can do it. With my help, you can do it. And I got to tell you that you never go wrong with betting with Hashem. You can take Hashem's hand. You can take it to the bank. And I've learned a lot about the process, about when the answer is no, when the answer is not now, when the answer is yes. Um, and and I, I, I'm still in the process, but I'm always learning. It is a journey, right? And who you are today is not who you are tomorrow. But your identity, like I, I said to you before, I have a core four, right? All these things can change in the world, but these four things never change. Is Ani Yehudi, I'm a Jew. You know, Ani Bat Melech, I'm the daughter of a king. Ani Eved Hashem, I am a servant of a king. And Ani Devor Esther, and that's it. And, and everything else can change in life. But so long as I have these four core things working with me, I can go anywhere with Hashem. And, and I really hope that that is something that every Jew knows, that you have a purpose that only you can do. Only you can do. And with Hashem's help, you can be successful, even if you fail today. There's always tomorrow. The fact that you woke up, there's a tomorrow. So you said, you said a lot of things that made me, that made me think. Um, one of the things that, that I was thinking about as I was listening to you is, uh, <clears throat> you know, when, when uh, in developmental psychology, when, when um, let's say children, we're, all, we're also developing, but when children are, are growing, they can get very, there's the, this um, misnomer called the terrible twos, which with all my kids started before two and ended way after two. But um, the, the reason the terrible twos are so terrible is because they're forming their identity. Right. And I want to put on my shoes. They don't know how to tie their shoes, but I want to do it, right? They put them on backwards. I want to do it. I want to, why, why are they like that? Right. Because they're in that gray zone where they don't really have it yet. So they become overly belligerent because they feel like they're at a risk of losing it. And that phenomenon is true in adult, adult development, adult psychology as well, which is that, that when, when, when we don't know who we are, we become very combative about it. Yes. This is, very, this is a very common thing in the United States today, right? That people are become, can become, not everyone, thank God, but people can become extremely combative about their identity. Right. I'm like this and you're like that and you're making me and, da, da, da. I think and the, the definitions point. keep changing and growing. 
Right, right, and 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 it all comes from from a from from this this um this lack of sense of comfortable sense of self of like you said I need the vorele right I need Yudia I need Batmelech I need Eved I need the vorele like a certain it, the, the, the identity is not allowed to kind of um, spring forth naturally. So since we don't know who we are, so we have to fight and 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 preserve the boundaries because we don't want to lose, no one wants to lose themselves, and I think that's what we see a lot in in the world today. Um, you know that that made me. It, it didn't make me think. Um, you know the the Tower of Babel, which is really where you really see the beginning of 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 identity and clash clash of cultures and clash of language. Uh, according to the commentary of the Natsif, uh, Berlin, in his commentary, he he writes that what was going on over there. It's not. It's like if you look at it, it's not really clear like what they did wrong. Right. The, the the sages say that they were they were fighting God, but you, if you look in the verses, it doesn't say that not explicitly. So he explains what they were doing. What they were doing is that the reason they they, they built a tower was it was like a big brother is watching. They were saying, you know what? Let's everyone be together. If you want to build a city, you want to expand the city. You have to expand it, but we have to be able to see you because we want to make sure everything's within regulation because we all have to be the same. We all have to be one. <laughs> Boy, that Torah is really smart, huh? <laughs> Amazing stuff. And that, Akash Baruch Hu says, that's a war on God. Right. Why? Because God made people different. Right. God made people different. So you have to let people be themselves. And if you're not going to let people be themselves, you're not just fighting against people, you're fighting against God himself. Right. That's the way he explains it. It's, it's, it's magnificent. And the pu- their punishment was that God, God says, you know what? Watch, I'm going to change your dialects just a little bit. And let's see how, how well you guys can communicate. So you'll see how different you are. And the rest is history, quite literally. The right, rest literally. All the cultures, all these languages, people speaking past each other, and we're still figuring it out. We're still finding a way to come together. The Jewish vision is that the world comes together, but everyone is able to calmly, confidently be themselves without being threatened by anyone else right. and not threatening anyone else. Right. And, and, you know, every, like I always say, I, I used to say like this, this, I used to have this analogous where, you know, I say, you know, it's, good you know everybody's building a house like if you think class or everybody's building a house and everybody wants to be the big you know crane guy right that's doing the big stuff right uh, but, but without the screws and the nails right <laughs> you have nothing you just have like a bunch of steel and wood and that's it and so i i remember like being okay with that like sometimes you have to be okay with the little stuff and sometimes you have to be okay that it's not okay, that you don't have all the answers, that it didn't work out. And, and that's okay too. And I think we do, we put a lot of pressure, um, especially, you know, I always call it the Insta sham life. When you see all this, like we have it all together and it's so perfect. And look at me now, you know, and it's not the real thing. And, you know, when you, if you take it, if you were just turn the camera a little and you'd see what's really going on, you would see that. We don't, there's no one here who has it really together. We're all looking. Um, I really believe that the Torah is the manual to life. Like there's this famous saying, no one gives you instructions to life. I don't believe that. So I believe Hashem really did give us instructions to life. Yeah. And I, I feel like there's a reason why the nations are either constantly telling you to be the Jew or they're constantly trying to take it from you because there's something worth taking, if you will. There's something there of value. And I really hope that a lot of people, especially in this day and age, will really feel okay with the fact that sometimes it's not okay. Sometimes, and, and that, that has to be okay. And gamze le tova, this too shall be for the good. And I think, and I pray, I really pray with Hashem's help that we do start getting back to what is a Jew and how do you survive in this world as a Jew? And I think that we need to do this together. Um, and many of us have been in this journey uh, like you said, you know, you were not from from birth. I, I was not from from birth. Um, but I think that, you know, I always gain Hizuk out of my own story. I mean, I came from a nothing, nothing, like really a nothing. Um, and, and Hashem made something, right? He made something out of this nothing. And you're talking about a girl who had no identity uh, to several identities and, and to now finding the real identity. And it's been a journey. Um, but I think it's been a pleasant journey getting to know a Shem without all the noise of everything else, you know, not everyone else's opinion of who a Shem should be in my life. I felt like the greatest gift that I gave to myself was allowing myself to go on the journey to discover a Shem and, and who am I? And I think that I, 
you know, have been able to change those three words, who am I, to who I am. Um, and, and those four things never change, no matter what's going on in the world, it never change. So is there any last words you'd like to share to anyone um, who's going through this journey, whether they are teenagers, whether they're converso, whether they, they got off the derrick, wherever it is they find themselves in life, what would you say to them to give them Zoom? So um, thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you. Really, it's is, it is a pleasure. And um, it's, just very, it's just very exciting that you're, how you share your journey. And, and like you're saying, you have listeners who are on different journeys, similar or different, but, but, uh, but everyone can really learn from one another. Um, just one of the things I think that I, I, um, I co-authored this book with, with uh, my, my very close friend, Rabbi Yosef Lin, on individuality and identity. And, um, you know, it's always great when someone gives you like real feedback, you know, you put something out there in the world and if you're like, oh, it's a nice book, it's a nice book. So there's, there's a <laughs> very smart lady um, um, who was an educator in, in a high school, a girls' high school in, in a, a, a Jewish religious girls' high school in New York. And she's like, mm, I don't know about your book. I was like, oh, <laughs> why not? So she said, she said, young people today are made, have been made very nervous very, very nervous and anxious about this pressure to know who they are and who they have to be. And your book, I think it's very nice, but, but I don't know if that's what people need today. And, you know, it really kind of shook me because um, I started thinking about that. And I started thinking, you know what, it's hard. Like when I was, uh, when I was interviewing for college, I remember uh, I interviewed at Yale and the interviewer at Yale, who, who was, you know, she seemed like much older than me, but she's, I found out later she's a junior in college. And she's like, tell me, what's, what are you passionate about in life? I remember very clearly being terrified by that question. I had no idea what I was passionate about. I was 17 years old, you know, I'm just, I don't know anything. Right. right? Um, and, and also I felt kind of bad about myself. I felt like maybe I should. Why don't, why, don't, why don't I know what I'm passionate about? <laughs> what's wrong <Right>. with me? <laughs> Right. And I, I actually remember when I went to yeshiva and, and you, you, you learn, you know, yeshiva people, everyone's like fine looking for themselves and everything. Right, right. And there's a famous oft quoted line from the beginning of the Mesilati Sharim of Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato. Yes. Great book. The, amazing book. Uh, amazing, amazing, amazing book. Um, and he writes in the beginning that, that the foundation and the root of everything really of service of God um, and, and doing the right thing is knowing what your obligation is in your world, what your mission is more than obligation, your mission in your world. Um, and I think when you read that, you kind of think to yourself like, oh my gosh, yeah, I have to know my mission. A foundation of a building, everything is built in the foundation. So you have to build the foundation first. And there's, there's some truth to that. But it could also make you very, very anxious because my life has to go on. I'm going to be making decisions. If I don't have it clear now, what am I going to do? So you end up just kind of like hovering over it. Like, I don't know who could I could do like this. And I think it's like, that's not what he means. He doesn't mean the foundation of your life. That would be very high pressure. Then you have to really, really know hundred percent who you are, what your mission is right. before you start anything. Right. It's a process. And, and you keep using the word journey and you say people are on journeys. What, what the Ramchal is saying is that at any given moment, if you want to know where you're going, why you're doing what you're doing, it's always going to come back to your identity. But that's true at any given moment. Doesn't necessarily mean that right now you have to figure it out, or else, or else you have to put life on pause. Life cannot be put on pause. Right. Life goes on, and we have to make, to make decisions, and we have to, we have to, we make choices between alternatives. And I, and I, I think that it, we have to know at the, uh, on one hand that identity is really at the core, and everything really flows from who we are. But on the other hand, like you keep saying very beautifully, it's a journey, it's a process. There's many things that we don't know about ourselves and where we come from. But keep digging keep growing, keep asking, keep uh, being courageous because you don't know what you're going to find out. Um, right. and, and as you do, it will give you more clarity and more confidence to make those decisions that are genuine to who you are. It's, fu it's funny how, you know, uh, Hashem opens up with this really with Adam HaRishon and he says, where are you, Adam? And really, I mean, he's not, he doesn't want to know where's your physical location. Hashem knows that. But he's asking, where are you, Adam? Like, where, take stock of yourself. Where are you? And I think that for any of us, whether you are Jewish or non-Jewish, Hashem is constantly asking us, where are you in life? And I think that so long as we keep having that conversation with Hashem, I think that no matter what's going on, it is going to be okay. And it's always going to be okay. 
but you can know that it's going to be okay, even when it doesn't seem like it's okay. Absolutely. Because you just keep saying, here I am, Hashem. Here I am. So I think that, you know, identity is something we can go on and on about this. You know, we can certainly have many classes about this. It is something that is ever evolving. Um, you know, finding yourself is one thing. Finding yourself in, in, with Hashem is another. Um, but it is a process. It is a journey. And it's funny because you mentioned uh, Moshe Chaim Lozato, and I love that book. And I really love, I don't know if you remember in the extended version when he opens up with the parable about the labyrinth. And he sure. says that life is like a labyrinth and you go through and you think you know the way and it looks like you should be taking a turn to the right and, and that's a closed end um, and you should be going to the left. And, and what he says is that it's only one who's gone through the labyrinth successfully is the one who you should be learning from. And he sits on top and he knows which way is the right way. And I really feel that in many ways, this is what the sages are uh, to us. And, and Hashem has put a lot of great people in every generation to kind of help pa- lead that pathway and to help guide others. And I pray that Bezerat Hashem, those people would come forward, that we would know and we learn from them. And we would, you know, not only learn, but we teach you know, who's a wise man, he who learns from everyone. And I think that there is something to be learned, but there's nothing like what we learn out of Klai Yisrael. And I pray that every person, whether they are from, from birth, whether they, um, whether they've had like four or five generations of people who were, who, who their parents were Jews. I'm not the Jew. I want you to know that you can always come back home. Hashem is always asking, where are you? And the day that you say, here I am, is when Hashem is, you're going to just, you're going to see things like just blossom open. And I really pray and hope that for every person that's on this journey. But that's it for today. Rabbi Jack, you have been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure having you. And I pray Mr. Hashem, this is not going to be the last time that we have you on. We'll have to find another subject or whatever it is. But this has been really great. And I hope everybody's enjoyed this. Uh, I'm going to link some information about Olami in the description box. If you'd like to look, learn, learn more about what they do there. Um, and hopefully I'll get a link to that book too. And you can judge for yourself whether it was a, a, you know, a good book or not. But um, that's it today. And I hope we'll all be together again soon. Visit at the Shem. So much for us. If you've enjoyed this video or know someone who would, please share it. Sikul Mitzvot. If you'd like to be notified of upcoming episodes, click subscribe to be notified. 